Good morning, and welcome to worship on this third Sunday in Lent. My name is Pastor Seth Novak, and on behalf of the entire congregation of Anya State Lutheran Church, I'd like to thank you for being a part of our worship service today. Our building may be closed, but the church is still open. You can download a worship bulletin with the order of service from the link in the video description below. Today we honor Saints Perpetua and Felicity and their companions, who were martyred in the city of Carthage in 203. Vivia Perpetua was a noblewoman and Felicity was a slave. Both were young women and were mothers of young children. Also martyred with them were uh, Revocatus, another slave, and Freeman, Saturninus, and Secundulus. All five were catechumens, which means they were converts to Christianity uh, awaiting baptism. Their catechist, Satyrus, was later arrested and joined them and baptized them during their house arrest. Their story is a quintessential martyrdom story. Arrested for their faith, they were thrown to the wild beasts in the amphitheater. What's interesting about them is that Perpetua kept an account of their imprisonment, including several mystical visions that she had during the time. That account became the core of a book called The Passion, the Passion of Perpetua and Felicity, which was enormously popular among early Christians. St. Augustine actually quotes it very often and he even had to caution people against revering it on the same level as the Bible. It gives a clear and vivid account of the early church in Northern Africa at the time. This group of Christians gladly chose to give up their lives rather than their faith, which you may or may not find praiseworthy, but they also, even in death, inspired faith in generations of Christians to come with their faithfulness and perpetuous fantastic visions as well as providing an important portrait of the church of their time for historians to study. We are grateful today for their witness, for their faith and the historical contributions of Perpetua and Felicity and all of their companions. They stand as a testament to the power of our stories to give hope and courage to others in times of despair and the importance of sharing those stories, which is why I'm glad to gather around this table today with them and their companions. Before we begin worship today, uh, we'll take a moment to share any prayer concerns you may have. If you want to share those concerns, you can share them in the comments or in the chat, being mindful of privacy in this public space. With that, I'll invite you to turn to your bulletin as we begin our worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and the power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. i 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Exodus chapter 20. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the inequity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. second reading is from the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. 
Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. The Jewish Passover was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He poured out the coins of the money changers and flipped over their, ta their tables. And to the ones selling doves, he said, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jewish authorities then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The authorities then said to him, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you would raise it in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> when I was in seventh grade, my class did a fundraiser for, I don't know, for something. I don't even really remember. All I remember is I had to sell t-shirts. <clears throat> now, being the relatively shy kid that I was, I was not about to go out door to door selling these things to strangers. That meant I was limited to family and friends. And so I took my box of t-shirts to where all of my friends were, and I set up a table in the narthex of my church. I don't remember if I sold very many, but I do remember uh, one of our family friends, somebody close to us, Pat. I remember Pat confronting me about how I should not be selling t-shirts in the church. It was something he felt really strongly about, and it was because of this story that we just read today. When Jesus said, you should not make my father's house a marketplace. Now, I was a kid, I loved and respected Pat, and I saw how upset he was, and I felt terrible. Relationships have always been really important to me. And the thought that I had done something, even unintentionally, to put my relationship with Pat in jeopardy made me feel sad and guilty. Now, in case you're thinking it, Pat's not the bad guy here. He approached me very respectfully because he felt strongly about this. And he wanted to set me straight. He wanted me to see that what I was doing was wrong. He read this story and he took it at face value, that the temple or the church is not a marketplace and it should not be. That's not what it's for and it's not how God wants us to use it. I always think about that when I read this story. <clears throat> I think about those stupid t-shirts and how afraid I was that I might have damaged this relationship with my friend. But each time I read this story, I also have to respectfully disagree with Pat's interpretation of this text. This is a complicated story to unpack, partly because of the way St. John tells it. <clears throat> it's different from the way any of the other gospel writers tell it. St. Mark quotes Jesus saying, you have made my father's house a den of thieves, implying that there's something shady happening here, some unfair business practices. And St. Matthew and St. Luke follow suit. But in John's story, Jesus says, marketplace, not den of thieves. According to John, there doesn't seem to be anything immoral or crass going on here, just honest business. You see, just before the Passover, people would come and offer sacrifices at the temple. Originally, when the temple system was set up, 
most folks had livestock of some kind of their own because uh, Israel was an agrarian society. Everyone had easy access to a cow or a goat or a dove, either from their own herds or flocks or by trading with a neighbor. But by Jesus' time, the folks in Judean cities had, were about as likely to have livestock as you or I. So in order to make a sacrifice, he had to buy one. <clears throat> and since the second commandment, which we read today, forbids the use of graven images, and the Roman coins with, were uh, graven, as it were, with the image of Caesar, they could not be used in the temple. They had to be changed for non-graven coins. And that's what the money changers did. All of this infrastructure was set up to facilitate the regular, legal, institutional worship of God in the temple as commanded by Torah. There's nothing wrong going on here. And that is what makes Jesus' action today so memorable. He's not cleansing the temple, he's destroying it, at least symbolically. He's making it so that people are unable to fulfill their biblically mandated obligations for worship. The building may be intact, but he's completely disrupted the infrastructure. Not because anybody was doing anything wrong, but because the system itself, the temple ordinances and practices, as outlined in Torah, was wrong. Well, okay. Wrong is maybe too strong a word, but let's unpack that. <clears throat> the laws given by God to Moses, who gave them to the Hebrew people in the wilderness, those laws were intended as a gift, as a fresh start. It was a set of rules for life together, life as God's people rather than Egyptian slaves, which was the only life they'd ever known. Those laws were intended to help people know God and who God was by showing them how God intended for them to live in community. Unfortunately, it's always a lot easier to judge whether or not a rule has been broken than it is to meditate on it and figure out what that rule teaches us about God. And so we end up placing a lot of weight on rules rather than on the God who gives them. <clears throat> and I think that that is what Jesus sees here. He sees how the concept of worship seems to have morphed into this transactional system of sacrifice. And that makes him upset. So upset that instead of lodging a, an official complaint or going out and teaching an alternative, he just grabs a whip and starts flipping tables. And when the folks in charge ask for a sign, some argument to justify his action or proof that he has the authority to do this, he points to himself. He was speaking of the temple of his body. Jesus is himself the sign. I wonder if what made Jesus so angry, angry enough to break things, was that he was so saddened that this was the only experience of God that people had at that temple. An experience that felt sad and guilty that feeling of a person who's ruined a relationship, intentionally or not, by breaking the rules. Our relationship with God had become transactional. We do this, God does that in return. I can't help but think that in symbolically destroying the temple, Jesus was trying to destroy our misconception of a legalistic God who only cares whether or not we keep the rules. Instead of this transactional God, Jesus presents us with an alternative, a relational God, a living person with whom we can converse and reason and argue, a person to be embraced and loved or rejected, even killed. He invites us to deal with God relationally, not transactionally. And he is himself the sign that God wants to deal with us the same way. God doesn't just love us or bless us when we perform the proper ritual actions or fulfill the requirements. God doesn't love us in order to get us to do those things. God does that whenever God feels like it, because that is who God is. This is God's covenant that God desires to convey in the law. That God's love for us precedes anything that we might do or say or believe about God. 
and that we are always invited into this relationship, that we are not independent of it. The covenant is that God always loves first and constantly invites us into that love. The law is not a list of rules to follow, but a description of what that love looks like in action for people who have never experienced it firsthand. Not really. To reduce that love to a set of rules, or to a collection of religious doctrines for that matter, it seems to me to miss the point entirely. It seems only to continue on in that same transactional view of a God who refuses to offer love or blessing unless the terms are first met. This isn't a story about whether Christianity is superior to Judaism, or whether or not sacrifice is necessary, or which rules we need to follow. I can only read this story as a story of Jesus desperately trying to point out a reality that is too fantastic, too sweeping, too profound for us ever to reason out on our own. God doesn't look like we think God looks like. God isn't just a product of our imaginations. God is something bigger. If this is true, if God doesn't simply judge us as good or bad based on how well we happen to live up to God's expectations, then I find myself wondering, what does that say about how we might judge one another? If God deals with us relationally and wants us to deal with God relationally rather than transactionally, how might God hope for us to deal with one another? It's so easy to see others as good or bad, as right or wrong, depending on how they meet the expectations that we have of them. In other words, to deal with them transactionally. But Jesus invites us to consider another way, to live relationally rather than transactionally, to recognize that people, both ourselves and our neighbors, are more than our best or our worst actions. Or as Luther would say, that we are all simultaneously sinners and saints. When Pat confronted me that day, I felt really hurt. But that's not the end of that story. Pat and I continued in that relationship because, and because of that, there are a lot more things that I think of first when I think of Pat. I think of how he gave me a job in high school. All the dirty jokes he loves to tell and loves to hear me tell. I think of all the meals and the beers and the stories we've shared, all the discussions and the arguments we've had. I remember how he helped me make an urn for my dad's ashes after he died, and for the love and the support that he gave to my family in that time. That's why, even though I disagree with him, kind of vehemently about some things, I will always love and respect him. That's what relationship is. It's too complex to be boiled down to a handful of good or bad things. It's this big, messy, beautiful thing that just keeps growing. And that, I think, is what Jesus is trying to teach us about God and God's covenant in that moment in the temple. The covenant isn't a contract with rules and consequences. It's a promise of a living, organic relationship founded for all time on the deep and abiding love that is at the core of who God is. And because of that foundation, it can never be broken, not really, because that love is strong enough to withstand rejection and exile, strong enough to rebuild temples, strong enough even to come back from the dead.
Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Your name is holy. Guide your church so that in every situation, your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your laws defend the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judges, and law enforcers to protect the well-being and freedom of all, especially those vulnerable groups we name now, silently or aloud. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The heavens declare your glory. Renew your creation. Provide leaders in the struggle for clean air and water. Give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to those who are suffering, especially those who we now name, silently or aloud. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ. Give clarity to this congregation and to our leaders. Help us to follow Christ beyond our own habits and comforts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Thank you for all the martyrs whose witness reveals the power of the cross. Give us the same trust that Jesus had in life and in death. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Many people imagine Lent merely as a time of somber self-sacrifice. But we are reminded in this season that our task is to shift our focus away from ourselves and our own desires and distractions and back to God, who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Repentance is not the frightful appearance before an angry God, but a homecoming to one who longs to love and save us in the midst of our trials and fears. One powerful way that Christians have practiced repentance through the ages is with intentional acts of charity sharing that steadfast love with our neighbors. Anya's day is committed to sharing God's love with all our neighbors, regardless of age or ethnicity or ability, of faith background or race or family configuration, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression. We believe that all people should be able to experience the love of God in the community of Jesus Church. You can be a part of sharing this good news with the wider community by supporting On You Stay financially. Just follow the link in the video description below to make a one-time gift or to set up a recurring donation. Thank you for helping On You Stay welcome all of God's children home. Oh, no. 
as we prepare our hearts and our tables to receive the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God of the journey. Your mercy is everlasting, and your faithfulness endures from age to age. You set your bow in the clouds as a sign to Noah, and gave Avram and Sarai new names to seal your covenant. In the wilderness, you blessed Israel with your law, an everlasting testament to your love for them. Through grumbling and rebellion, through wilderness and exile, you remained with your people, faithful when we were faithless, until the time when you sent your Son to establish a new covenant which could not be broken, to write your law upon our hearts. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, this, is the new, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Whenever we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. You are with us still, faithful God. Send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us on our journey with this bread and cup. A foretaste, the feast that is to come, when all the world will be fed at your table of justice and mercy. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with Noah, with Abraham and Sarah, with Moses and Joshua, with the prophets and the martyrs of every age, who have looked with the eyes of faith to see your promised deliverance, in which you have made tangible in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, all honor and glory is yours, O divine beloved. With your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you are not receiving the meal this morning, then receive this blessing. <clears throat> May Christ forever flip over the tables that stand between you and the experience of God's love. Amen. If you are receiving the meal this morning, hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is eternal. Take away the sin of the world, have mercy.
Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that your, our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Before we conclude, I'd just like to remind everyone that um, next Sunday, March 14th, is the beginning of Daylight Saving Time. This is the one where if you forget, you end up being late for church rather than early. However, this year, if you're late to worship, you don't have to miss the beginning. So there's, some, there's a silver lining for you, right? In any case, remember to set your clock ahead one hour next weekend. Or don't, because we're all on pandemic time anyway, right? So who cares? <laughs> Once again, I want to thank you for being a part of this worship service today. If you found today's service meaningful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel so you can continue to find us. We gather here for worship as on you stay every Sunday at 9.45 a.m. I also hope that you'll join us for our midweek Lenten worship series on the saints for today. As we discern how to navigate an increasingly polarized and conflicted social landscape, we're spending this Lenten season learning from various ordinary Christians who found ways to remain true to their, convic their convictions of the gospel while also reaching out to stand in solidarity with people who are different from them. To work for healing and reconciliation and to bear, uh, bear such witness to God's love that we have come to call them saints. Uh, this week, our topic will be on uh, Dorothy Day, and Father Eric Stell will be presenting. We gather every Wednesday on Zoom at 11 a.m. and again at 7 p.m. The link and the phone number to join that, uh, that worship service can be found on our website under the Events tab uh, on, on our website, onustaylutheran.org. There you can also find links to our weekly Wednesday Bible study, um, the knitting group, and many other activities happening through this congregation. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Amen. I'd like to invite you to share the peace of Christ with someone you know with a call or a text or an email, or by sharing this video on your social media page, or sending a link to a friend so that you can worship together. God bless you in your week.